Good morning and welcome to Rising. We've got a great show for you today. I know things probably look a little bit strange. We've had some technical difficulties with our usual studio. Uh, there was a flood, I believe a plague of locusts. Um, once we have the engineer and the exorcist uh, get out here, we'll be back in our usual digs. But for now, we're making it work. Lovely to sort of see you, Nomiki. <laughs> I mean, it is Washington, it is the swamp, and there's a lot happening existentially with this country. Uh, but do want to throw out Happy Indigenous Peoples Day, too, because um, it is a holiday mm. in this country. So And Happy Columbus Day because of my Italian ancestry. Although, did you see that. the news about Columbus? I, I've heard they're trying to cancel a, uh, a hero to my people. So you Well, know, he could we'll be an Italian Jew. They're that. saying that he has Jewish lineage. So, oh, okay. You know, Rome has a long history of that, ancient Rome. Just adds more fascination to the mystery of who our founding people were. Fascinating. Well, let's get into our top news story. Just three weeks out from Election Day, and former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris are locked in a dead heat. Harris and Trump each getting 48% support from registered voters in the latest NBC News poll. Now, key findings from the survey show three things. Harris's popularity is declining after her summertime boost. There's a massive gender gap between support for Trump and for Harris, and abortion is a top motivating issue. Now, CNN contributor Scott Jennings spelled out the gender gap issue for his fellow panelists. Let's watch. And this gender gap issue is real. It's a real problem, and you see the Democrats reacting to it, and I think what they are now filing in October of the election coming to realize is that uh, a lot of men think Democrats care more about dudes who want to become women than dudes who just want to be dudes. Well, and, no, and, no, and no hunting, cosplay, or cringy videos is going to change it. The bet is made. Working class men, whether you're black, Hispanic, or white, persistently, consistently do not believe the Democratic Party, and specifically Kamala Harris, are going to do a thing for them. They've been told that they're the problem, and I suspect they're going to rise up on Election Day and tell the elites who told them that you're wrong. Well, a New York Times Siena poll shows Harris' support among Hispanic voters is, quote, in dangerously low territory for Democrats, while Trump has managed to tighten his grip on this crucial demographic. The poll found Harris vulnerable with the voter bloc when it comes to the economy, migration, and crime. Politico says part of the problem for Harris is that Trump, the Trump effect, 56 percent of Americans now favor deporting all undocumented immigrants, up to 20 points from eight years ago. Trump is expected to appear at a Univision town hall on Wednesday. When Harris spoke at Univision last week, she took time to tout her endorsement by Bush's attorney general, Alberto Gonzalez. Reacting on threads, influencer Yashar Ali wrote, quote, I am immersed in Republican culture. I speak to tons of conservatives from far right to MAGA to Bush style conservatives. None of them would be moved by who Alberto Gonzalez or Dick Cheney are endorsing. It's what some liberals think matter because they don't understand Republican culture and media these days. It's a cut and paste approach. And in other bad news for Harris, Democrats' voter registration advantage has dropped in three key battleground states, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Nevada. Experts blame a lack of enthusiasm for the Democratic Party. Meanwhile, in a puzzling move, Trump has spent a lot of time campaigning recently in several deep blue states. On Friday, he was in Colorado. He announced a rally in New York City before the end of the month. And he was in California on Saturday where, by the way, a possible third assassination attempt on tr Trump was thwarted. It all happened after a local cop arrested an armed man outside the Trump Trump's rally. The 49-year-old man was caught at a police checkpoint, allegedly trying to enter the rally with a fake press pass. Cops noticed his car was unregistered and then searched the car where they found fake IDs, a shotgun, a loaded handgun, and a high-capacity uh, magazine per officials. Now, the suspect has been identified as Vem Miller. He was released on a $5,000 bail. He describes himself as a huge Trump supporter, and he said he always travels with his guns. Now, according to Fox News, the Trump campaign does not view this as an actual assassination attempt. So let's start uh, right there, and then maybe we'll circle back to the polling. So I understand why tensions are high. There were two assassination attempts on Trump's life. One successfully shot at him, wounded him, killed another person, injured others. So we're all on very high alert. 
In this case, you know, while details are very early, this suspect has been identified. He was taken into custody and released on bail. He describes himself a, a very vividly, and he's given interviews. And his views are very pro-Trump, are, are conservative-leaning. Um, he says he travels with guns because he gets death threats. He, you know, he disputed that he had fake IDs or that he wasn't allowed to be there, that kind of thing. You know, that will be sorted out. It doesn't sound like he was there. No one has made a case that he was actually there to harm Trump, and the Trump campaign also doesn't view it that way. So we should probably not actually put this one in the category of, you know, of assassination attempt, although I'm very glad authorities took swift action that this looked shady, it looked suspicious, and they actually did something about it is, is a, you know, A-plus job. You know, I was thinking about when I was covering Trump rallies in 2015 and 2016 and other events like QAnon events in Arizona and how many people were carrying guns. Uh, in many of these states, there's open carry states, not all of them, of course. And it is a question. I mean, if, if you're in this politically charged environment, you don't really know what everybody's intention is. And I think that's something the authorities are going to be looking into with him is what really was his intent? Were there any manifestos like previous assassination attempts? And let's not forget, the last two did have conservative backgrounds, uh, former Trump supporters that turned and focused on Ukraine, the, the first assassination attempt. Um, and then the second one was a conservative. I, the problem is, is it's, it's it's clearly mental health. We understand that people are being radicalized and can go, go down rabbit holes and may have different intentions, whether it's to assassinate a president, to get a to get their own attention, um, or just, uh, you know, there's some sort of strange conspiracy theory that's leading them there. We're going to find out more. Obviously, the fake IDs are bizarre. The fact that the car wasn't registered, also bizarre. Um, you know, who doesn't register their car? And is that part of some bigger story here? And we'll, well learn I mean, over time. Yeah, I mean, lots of people, you know, don't, re I mean, not, you, certainly you should, and if you're, you know, violating the law by not having registration or having guns you're not supposed to possess, I am, you know, fully on board with prosecuting people um, in those cases. I just, we don't even, we don't even know that this guy is necessarily uh, mentally ill in the same way that certainly the, the first shooter was uh, was absolutely uh, mentally ill. I mean, this guy's not even a shooter, right? He says he's never fired these guns. He just happens to own them for his self-protection. Again, I'm, I'm not saying that excuses him or makes him innocent of some crime here. I just don't, there, there's no reason even at this point to think he is necessarily some unstable gunman, um, just that he had I the think guns. But the IDs are what are, I'm, I'm alarmed by, is yeah. the fake IDs. Of course, it's legal to carry guns. And as I said, at many rallies, people were carrying them. Made me feel a little uncomfortable when they were yelling at me as the media, but, uh, <laughs> you know, especially in this politically charged environment. I mean, th th this is actually the issue, though, as, as we're going to talk more about polls, is there are these divides over some serious cultural issues, cultural issues in that do Democrats and progressives deeply understand what conservatives are feeling and even the conservatives that may not be voting for Trump? And how do you sway over those folks on the Harris side? Yeah. I, and I think that's kind of what's at bay here is the Harris campaign right now is trying to navigate this group of voters that are conservative leaning, anti-Trump and and some men, even if it's just a few percentage of the men, uh, to get them off the couch to support Harris and getting into their psyche is very difficult. I mean, they probably have to hire some sort of psychologist to analyze, and I hope they are, because it's it seems like they're not penetrating and they need to get them off the couch uh, because there are major culture divides in this country and there's a portion of the population that really doesn't speak, they're not being spoken to um, maybe the way that they tr traditionally were in, when we had a more traditional two-party system. I think it's fascinating that we might be ending the era of extreme racial polarization. We're now experiencing racial depolarization where it's not so automatic that non-white people are Democrats. Trump Republicans are doing better with black males, Latino males. We're experiencing, as you said, increased uh, gender, sex-based uh, polarization and education status. Um, you know, if you go back 15 years, there's, real, there's no difference in education in, uh, income is a little bit more complicated, but education particularly in who's voting for who party. And now it's the elites, the better educated, the wealthier voting for, uh, for Democrats. And, you know, this is going to, Kamala Harris is only doing 
so well. Um, you know, she certainly improved on where Biden was standing. And when she initially became the new candidate, there was a lot of enthusiasm. I would argue some of it was a little vibes based and <laughs> to some degree manufactured by the media. And I think that has been borne out because now she's come down a little bit despite having, you know, what everyone described as a myself included as a as a good debate performance against Trump hasn't ended up you know, solidifying any kind of advantage. She's doing better than, than Biden. And I, I think that, you know, goes to show that she's not a particularly tested commodity. She was sprung on the American people. She was substituted at the last minute. And she's doing, you know, again, better than Biden, well by some metrics, but the polls have it neck and neck. And again, this goes to the fundamental question. I say this all the time. This is the only question that matters. Are the polls exactly accurate this time, in which case Kamala can rest assured she's probably going to win? Or are they off by even a little bit? They're always Remembering off Remembering <laughs> that they were off massively yeah. in Biden, in Democrats' favor four years ago. Well, if that also, is the case again, Trump is going to win in a landslide. Well, that's also because, let's keep in mind, and this is what's, I think, very difficult for both campaigns to assess, is 2020 was a record turnout year because of those mail-in votes, because we were dealing with a pandemic. There were far more votes than ever in history, and in 2016, there were more votes than ever in history, for both sides, by the way. So, you know, it's really hard to assess what turnout's going to be like this election since we don't have a pandemic, since there isn't mandatory mail-in votes uh, in many states the way that there were a few years ago. Uh, but simultaneously, the gender divide is really what this is about. I think that that the conversation about white working class males is a little outdated based on 2016. We've had a pandemic. Uh, a lot of folks have unfortunately passed away because of COVID and also just aging out those older voters. She is doing significantly better with young women, uh, more so than ever in history. And he is doing better, not significantly better, better with some younger men uh, than previous elections, you know, Republicans have done. And it's not just a class thing. I mean, you have educated uh, young men and educated women who are voting in different directions. That doesn't, because somebody's educated, doesn't mean that they're better off or they're elite. They could have gone to a state school. They could have be saddled with uh, debt, as most young people are that have gone to, even, even if they went to a two-year college or went for one year to school, we have a crisis with student loan debt in this, com in this country, and credit card debt has gone up to record rate levels because of previous years of inflation yeah. due to the pandemic. So, you know, the way that we define working class nowadays is is broken, in my opinion. I think there are plenty of educated folks out there who are really struggling to survive, many who live in cities with rising rents, uh, the cost of living being much higher, and delaying having children. It's not our traditional assumption of what, uh, how we look at economic uh, layouts in politics have been in, over the years. It's, I think we're really modeling this after 2016, but the country has changed a lot, even so that people are just used to Trump. I mean, one of the, uh, the New York Times did an assessment, Nate Silver, and he broke down several of the reasons why the numbers are laying out this way. I just think the unifying thing is that Donald Trump is winning over a few more male voters in each demographic. It's not that he is doing, he's winning with African-Americans. It's not that he's winning with Latinos. He is doing a margin better than previous years, and she is doing a margin worse. But I also think a sneaky factor here is there are going to be women who may not be telling pollsters that they're voting for Kamala Harris, but when they get in that polling booth, they're going to vote for her. And there are going to be men who may be saying that they're going to turn out, and they're not going to turn out, because it is statistically and historically harder to turn out men than it is women. Women vote more. Uh, there are a larger voting population on top of it. And I really do think that they're going to sway the election. And in 2016, it was about the white women. This year, it's about the white men. Hmm. Well, we shall see. Lots more to get into today on Rising. Stay tuned.